This is section 17 of Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain, section 17, Territorial Enterprise, April 1864. Territorial Enterprise, April 20th, 1864, Frightful Accident to Dan de Quill. Our time-honored confrere Dan met with a disastrous accident yesterday while returning from American City on a vicious Spanish horse, the result of which accident is that at the present writing he is confined to his bed and suffering great bodily pain. He was coming down the road at the rate of a hundred miles an hour, as stated in his will, which he made shortly after the accident, and on turning a sharp corner he suddenly hove in sight of a horse standing square across the channel. He signaled for the starboard, and put his helm down instantly, but too late, after all. He was swinging to port, and before he could straighten down, he swept like an avalanche against the transom of the strange craft. His larboard knee, coming in contact with the rudder-post of the adversary, Dan was wrenched from his saddle and thrown some three hundred yards, according to his own statement, made in his will above mentioned. Alighting upon solid ground, and bursting himself open from the chin to the pit of the stomach, his head was also caved in out of sight, and his hat was afterward extracted in a bloody and damaged condition from between his lungs. He must have bounced end for end after he struck first, because it is evident he received a concussion from the rear that broke his heart. One of his legs was jammed up in his body nearly to his throat, and the other so torn and mutilated that it pulled out when they attempted to lift him into the hearse which we had sent to the scene of the disaster, under the general impression that he might need it. Both arms were indiscriminately broken up until they were jointed like a bamboo. The back was considerably fractured and bent into the shape of a rail fence. Aside from these injuries, however, he sustained no other damage. They brought some of him home in the hearse and the balance on a dray. His first remark showed that the powers of his great mind had not been impaired by the accident, nor his profound judgment destroyed. He said he wouldn't have cared a damn if it had been anybody but himself. He then made his will, after which he set to work with that earnestness and singleness of purpose which have always distinguished him, to abuse the assemblage of anxious hash-house proprietors who had called on business, and to repudiate their bills with his customary promptness and impartiality. Dan may have exaggerated the above details in some respects, but he charged us to report them thus, and it is a source of genuine pleasure to us to have the opportunity of doing it. Our noble old friend is recovering fast, and what is left of him will be around the brewery again today, just as usual. Territorial Enterprise, April 1864 An Infamous Proceeding By Dan De Quill some three days since, in returning to this city from American Flat, we had the misfortune to be thrown from a fiery untamed steed of Spanish extraction, a very strong extract, too. Our knee was sprained by our fall, and we were a day or two confined to our room, of course knowing little of what was going on in the great world outside. Mark Twain, our confrere and roommate, a man in whom we trusted, was our only visitor during our seclusion. We saw some actions of his that almost caused us to suspect him of contemplating treachery towards us, but it was not until we regained in some degree the use of our maimed limb that we discovered the full extent, the infamousness of this wretch's treasonable and inhuman plottings. He wrote such an account of our accident as would lead the public to believe that we were injured beyond all hope of recovery. The next day he tied a small piece of second-hand crepe about his hat, and, putting on a lugubrious look, went to the probate court, and, getting down on his knees, commenced praying. It was the first time he ever prayed for anything or to anybody, for letters of administration on our estate. Before going to the court to pray he had stuffed the principal part of our estate, consisting of numerous shares in the pewter inktum, into his vest pocket, also had secured our toothbrush, and had been using it a whole day. He had on our only clean shirt and best socks, also was sporting our cane and smoking our meerschaum. But what most showed his heartlessness and utter depravity 
was the disposition he made of our boots and coat. When we missed these we applied to Marshal Cook. The Marshal said he thought he could find them for us. He went on to say that for some time past he had noticed the existence of a suspicious intimacy between Twain and a nigger saloon-keeper, who had a deadfall on North B Street. Proceeding to this place, he found that he was correct in his conjecture. Twain had taken our boots and coat to the darkey, and traded them off for a bottle of vile whiskey, with which he got drunk. And when the police were about to snatch him for drunkenness, he commenced blubbering, saying that he was overcome for the untimely death of poor Dan. By this dodge he escaped the lock-up, but if he does not shortly give up our pewter tinctum stock, which is of fabulous veil, shell out our toothbrush and take off our socks and best shirt, he will not so easily escape the territorial prison. P.S. We have just learned that he stole the crepe he tied about his hat from the doorknob of Three's Engine House, South B Street. Territorial Enterprise, April 1864. Mark Twain Takes a Lesson in the Manly Art by Dan De Quill. We may have said some harsh things of Mark Twain, but now we take them all back. We feel like weeping for him. Yes, we would fall on his breast and mingle our tears with his'n but that manly shirt-front of his air now a bloody one and his nose is swollen to such an extent that to fall on his breast would be an utter impossibility yesterday he brought back all our things and promised us that he intended hereafter to lead a virtuous life this was in the forenoon in the afternoon he commenced the career of virtue he had marked out for himself and took a first lesson in boxing once he had the big gloves on, he imagined that he weighed a ton, and could whip his weight in Greek fire. He waded into a professor of the manly art like one of Howland's rotary batteries, and the professor, in a playful way he was, when he wants to take the conceit out of forward pupils, let one fly straight out from the shoulder and busted Mr. Twain in the snoot, sending him reeling, not exactly to grass, but across a bench, with two bountiful streams of claret spouting from his nostrils. At first his nose was smashed out till it covered nearly the whole of his face, and then looked like a large piece of tripe, but it was finally scraped into some resemblance of a nose when he rushed away for surgical advice. Pools of gore covered the floor of the club-room where he fought, and he left a bloody trail for half a mile through the city. It is estimated that he lost several hogsheads of blood in all. He procured a lot of sugar of lead and other cooling lotions, and spent the balance of the day in applying them with towels and sponges. After dark he ventured forth with his nose swollen to the size of several junk bottles, a vast, inflamed, and pulpy old snoot, to get advice about having it amputated. None of his friends recognize him now, and he spends his time in solitude, contemplating his ponderous vermilion smeller in a two-bit mirror which he bought for that purpose. We cannot comfort him, for we know his nose will never be a nose again. It always was somewhat lopsided, now it is a perfect lump of blubber. Since the above was in type, the doctors have decided to amputate poor Mark Twain's smeller. A new one is to be made for him of a quarter of veal. Territorial Enterprise, April 28, 1864. Letter from Mark Twain, Carson City, April 25th. Editor's Enterprise. The road from Virginia to Carson, as traveled by Wilson's coaches, is in excellent condition, the saying being neither muddy nor very dusty. The stages do not even stop to rest on the chalk hill. We came by the penitentiary, but I did not consider it worth while to stop at the institution more than a few minutes, inasmuch as I had been in it before. Bob Howland, the warden, was at his post, and I had sufficient confidence in him to leave him there. He is probably there yet. Note bene, when you journey in this direction, stop at the penitentiary and examine the native silverfish on exhibition there in the aquarium. They are caught in the warm springs. They are very like goldfish, only they are longer, and not so wide, and are white instead of yellow, and also differ from goldfish to some extent in the respect that they do not resemble them. This description may sound a little incoherent, but then I have set it down just as I got it from Bob Howland, in whom I have every confidence. 
Mr. Curry is erecting a handsome stone edifice at Warm Springs to be used as a hotel. I heard in the stage, and also since I arrived here, that an organized effort will shortly be made to rescue Janes, the murderer, from the Story County Jail. Whether it be true or not, it will not be amiss to put the officers on their guard with a hint. The Supreme Court began its session here today, and adjourned over until tomorrow, after hearing arguments for a new trial of Johnson for killing Horace Smith. The ground upon which a new trial is sought is that some testimony was admitted upon the first trial in the district court which should have been ruled out. I have spoken with District Attorney Corson on the subject, and he thinks the movement for a rehearing will not succeed. From present appearances, I think Alderman Earl will hold his seat for some time yet, if the sacred ambition to sit in a high place in spite of law and gospel to the contrary shall continue to animate him, as it has already been decided to submit his case through the district and city attorneys to the district court, and the long session now anticipated for the Supreme Court will doubtless delay his trial for some time. It would have been better, wouldn't it, for the counsel to have declared his seat vacant, and allowed him to take legal steps for its restitution himself. Governor Nye has not yet returned. It is said he will start back to Carson to-morrow. Acting Governor Clemens made a requisition upon H. F. Rice, Esquire, a day or two since, for offices for the Secretary of the Territory, rent-free, in accordance with the contract entered into by certain citizens during the late session of the legislature when the subject of removing the capital to Virginia was agitated. The requisition was duly honored, and in the course of the week handsome offices will be fitted up in the second story of the north end of the county buildings for the use of the Secretary and his clerks. Mr. Colburn, or Coleman, or whatever his name is, the young man with a penchant for trying unique experiments, and who was accused of committing a rape on an infant here three years ago, is in trouble again. A young girl who alleges that he seduced her in California some time ago is over here suing him for damages in the probate court. Your carrier here neglects some of his subscribers as often as two or three times a week, sometimes, or else his papers are stolen after he leaves them. Let the matter be attended to. The people hunger after Dan's intellectual rubbish. The ladies gave a festival here last Friday for the benefit of my chronic brick church. The net proceeds amounted to upwards of five hundred dollars, and will be applied to furnishing the edifice, which is still in a high state of preservation, and is gradually but surely becoming really ornamental. That is the church for the benefit of which I delivered a governor's message once, and consequently I still take a religious interest in its welfare. I could sling a strong prayer for its prosperity occasionally, if I thought it would do any good. However, perhaps it wouldn't. It would certainly be taking chances, anyhow. The ladies are making extraordinary preparations for a grand fancy-dress ball to come off in the county buildings here on the 5th of May, for the benefit of the great St. Louis Sanitary Fair. The most pecuniary results are anticipated from it, and, I imagine, from the interest that is being taken in the matter, the ladies of Gold Hill had better be looking to their laurels, lest the fame of their recent brilliant effort in the sanitary line be dimmed somewhat by the beneficial achievements of this forthcoming ball. The infernal telegraph monopoly saddled upon this territory by the last legislature, in the passage of that infamous special Humboldt Telegraph Bill, and afterwards clinched by a still more rascally enactment on the same occasion, is bearing its fruits, and the people here, as well as at Virginia, are beginning to wince under illegal and exorbitant telegraphic charges. They double the tariff allowed by law, and a man has to submit to the imposition, because he cannot afford the time and trouble of going to law for a trifle of five or ten dollars, notwithstanding the comfort and satisfaction he would derive from worrying the monopolists. The moment that law received the governor's signature last winter, you will recollect the telegraph company doubled their prices for dispatches to and from San Francisco, and that is not the worst they have done, if common report be true. This common report says the telegraph is used by its owners to aid them in stock gambling schemes. I recollect that on the night the jury went out in the Savage and North Potosi case and failed to agree, 
our San Francisco dispatch failed to come to hand, and the reason assigned was that a dispatch of three thousand words was being sent from Virginia to San Francisco, and the line could not be used for other messages. Now, that telegraph company may have made money by trading in North Potosi on that occasion, but who is young enough to believe they ever got two dollars and a half for that voluminous imagery dispatch? That telegraph is a humbug. The company are allowed to charge three dollars and fifty cents for the first ten words across the continent, and must submit to a considerable deduction on longer dispatches, but they take the liberty of increasing that rate some thirty-five per cent, and people have to put up with it. Colonel Cradlebaugh tells me that last year, when he was a delegate at Washington from this territory, they always charged him more for dispatches sent here than if they went through to California. The government pays the Overland Telegraph Company forty thousand dollars a year, with the understanding that government messages are to pass over the lines free of charge. But I know of several dispatches of this character that were not permitted to leave the telegraph offices until they were paid for. It is properly the district attorney's business to look after these telegraphic speculators, and that officer ought to be reminded of the fact. The next grand jury here will endeavor to make it interesting to the telegraph company. Gillespie's monument, the ratty old agricultural fair shanty, still rears its ghastly form in the plaza, and serves to remind me of that statement's extraordinary career in the House of Representatives. It consisted in saving to his country the usual but extravagant sum of eight or ten dollars a day extra pay to legislative reporters, and in making a speech in favor of the Sierra Seminary Bill, which had the effect of killing that really worthy measure. All through the session, Gillespie was mighty handy about smashing the life out of any little incipient law that he chose to befriend, with one of his calamitous speeches. His vote was patent, too. His nay invariably passed a bill, and his aye was the deadest thing. My language may be unrefined, but it has the virtue of being uncommonly strong. But that monument in the plaza looks as hungry as Gillespie does himself, and much more unsightly, and I look for one of them to eat the other some day, if they ever get close enough together. I depart for Silver Mountain in the Esmeralda stage at seven o'clock tomorrow morning. It is the early bird that catches the worm, but I would not get up at that time in the morning for a thousand worms, if I were not obliged to. Mark Twain. Territorial Enterprise, April 28th or 30th, 1864. Fragment of Original. Dan Reassembled. The idea of a plebeian like Dan supposing he could ever ride a horse. He! Why, even the cats and the chickens laughed when they saw him go by. Of course, he would be thrown off. Of course, any well-bred horse wouldn't let a common underbred person like Dan stay on his back. When they gathered him up, he was just a bag of scraps, but they put him together, and you'll find him at his old place in the Enterprise office next week, still laboring under the delusion that he's a newspaper man. End of section 17